Today we're going to start talking about content and we're going to introduce the idea of what marketing is and how marketing as a discipline has evolved over time. So let's start by talking about what marketing is. And uh, if you ask people on the street what marketing is, what you will hear for the most part is marketing is about advertising and it's about selling. And I want to open your minds a little bit to the fact that marketing involves a lot more things than that. Uh, but from a conceptual standpoint, uh, as we're going to discuss later, marketing is about creating satisfied customers, right? So it's about creating value for them. And I have here a quote uh, from Peter Drucker. Uh, if you guys don't know who Peter Drucker is, uh, he was one of the most influential uh, managerial uh, consultants and professors of the 20th century. And if there was a Nobel Prize in management, he probably would have gotten one, um, but there is not. So uh, if you have some spare time, uh, read some of his books. They are absolutely amazing. Uh, anyway, the interesting thing is he's not a marketing guy, per se. He's a management person. Uh, but this is what he has to say about a business, right? That a business, the two primary functions are marketing and innovation. Everything else is a cost. Okay, so the moment that you understand that, you realize how absolutely essential marketing is. Okay, so let's start talking about what it really means by that. Okay, so like I was mentioning before, marketing is about creating value, right? And I want you to realize that value, when you are engaging in a transaction with a customer, is going to be always defined from the perspective of the customer. Okay, if the customer cannot see that value that you think you are creating, right, um, it really doesn't matter what you think. Okay, and the reason why value is absolutely central is because for you to exchange anything, in this case, for the most part, tends to be money, right, with a customer for something that you are providing, either a good or a service, uh, they need to see the value on it. Otherwise, they will not actually complete the transaction, right? Uh, and the reason why we do this is because, of course, we want that transaction to happen. But we are thinking long term. It's not about the transaction today. It's not about ripping off customers, right? Which is something that marketing sometimes is accused of, right? Because if you rip customers off, if you are purely rational, other than not being ethical, which is not, and you shouldn't do it just based on that, uh, they just will not keep coming back, right? So if you don't rip customers off, if you actually create value for them and they're actually happy with what you are uh, providing them, whether it's a product or a service or a combination of products and services, right? Uh, then you're going to be able to build a relationship. They're going to keep coming back. So you're thinking long term, okay? And you're going to be able to retain some of that value that you have created. So the reason why people pay you money is because they want what you have, right? Or what you're providing. So if you are a tax consultant right now, right, we have changed our tax deadline instead of being April like usually, it's in July 15th, right now, and probably they'll start getting busy, right? And the reason why you go to a tax consultant is because you don't think like you can do a good job when you're filling your income tax, for example, right, in my case. So uh, the tax consultant has something that he or she has that is valuable to me. And because of that, I'm willing to pay money for them to actually just fill up some forms, right? And so that's where the value is. Marketing is about that value. Whether it's tax consultancy, it's a car, or it's some chocolate, it really doesn't matter, right? And that value that the customer sees, and only the customer, is what determines uh, the transaction. Now, when we're talking about customers, we need to make some distinctions and that uh, the average person on the street might actually not usually do. So the terminology, I think it's one of the things that separates somebody who is uh, educated in business and somebody who just uh, is the average Joe on the street. So you need to really understand the terminology so that you are speaking about the same things when you're having a conversation with somebody else, maybe in the finance department or even within the marketing department, right? You need to be able to I know exactly what it is that you're saying or they are saying, right? So I'm going to make a distinction between these three words that are oftentimes interchangeable uh, in everyday life. Okay, I'm going to make a distinction between needs, wants, and demand. Okay, now let's start with needs. And this is something that 
sometimes uh, people will say marketing creates needs. Uh, I will argue that's not actually true, right? Needs are inherent to the person. Needs are something that we are born with, right? Uh, and needs are essentially state of felt deprivation, right? So it's something that you're lacking, something that you feel it's not right. From the most basic ones like thirst uh, or hunger, right? You just feel it, it's just there, right? We have some mechanisms in our body that tell us, hey, you need to eat, you need to drink, otherwise you're gonna have serious consequences. Uh, two other things, like we need socialization, right? I mean, sadly these days, right, we've been on in lockdown and, you know, maintaining social distancing. And it's hard, right? Because we actually enjoy the interaction with other people, right? So we have that need to belong and that need to interact with other people from society. In fact, what do we do to harden criminals when uh, they misbehave in jail? The worst thing that we can do to them is to put them in isolation, right? Um, yeah. Uh, so what I'm trying to say is these needs are inherent to the person. They haven't changed in thousands of years, right? Uh, and they're just with us the entire time. Right? Now, uh, other than the needs that we have inherently, there are wants. Now, what is a want? A want is a need that is a uh, transformed by a societal interaction and technology. So what do I mean by this? Well, for example, humans, like I was saying, uh, they are social animals, right? And because of that, one thing that we need is we need to communicate with other humans, right? And the way we communicate with humans has changed over time, right? If you want to establish long-term co uh, communication with somebody, uh, if you go back a few thousand years, right, the way you will do it is you will just walk to the other city and then talk to them, right? There was no telephone or there were no fax machines, which is archaic at this point. There was no email, right? So if you wanted to have a, a conversation with somebody, you actually literally physically had to go, right? There was no teleconferencing, no Zoom, right? Uh, and then technology evolved. People found other ways of uh, achieving those needs based on what they could do, right? So you have smoke signals, right? Uh, which were used to be able to communicate quickly, long distance, simple messages, right? Danger is coming, right? The enemy is here, right? Uh, you know, telegraph, uh, the Pony Express, right? So there are many other ways in which we have satisfied these needs uh, that are inherent to us based on what we have achieved in terms of technology and how uh, these social norms have been created or what is typical and what is acceptable and what is not, right? So needs and wants are different, okay? Needs are inherent to the person. Wants are the way in which we satisfy those needs using uh, technology and uh, societal norms, okay? And then demand or demands are wants, right? Uh, that we could actually fulfill because we have the purchasing power to back them up, right? So let me give you a simple example. I want a Ferrari, right? They are very nice sports cars. Uh, they are really amazing if you're into technology and into sports cars. However, uh, given that I have three kids and the career that I have, I'm not going to be able to afford a Ferrari, right? I don't have a quarter million dollars uh, to be spent on a car. Right? because I need to make my house payments and I need to send my kids to college, right? So because of that, because I've made those choices and I don't have the money to back it up, even though I want a Ferrari, I cannot demand one, right? I cannot actually go and buy it. So that's the distinction between these three concepts and this is very important for you to understand, right? Needs are inherent to the person. Wants are the way we satisfy those needs based on the technology and the social norms, what is acceptable. And demands are ones that are backed by purchasing power. Okay, now what do we observe in the marketplace? What we observe in the marketplace, we're going to call market offerings. Now, offerings are essentially a combination of products, services, and maybe information and experiences. So, what I'm trying to say is if you listen to a lot of the conversations that we're going to have, we're going to talk about products a lot. Right. 
And the reason why we're going to talk about products a lot is because they are in many ways easier to, to understand than services or information and experiences, right? And because they are tangible, right? They are things that you can touch, you can see, and because of that, you can evaluate with your senses easier, right? But if you look at the U.S. economy, right, and most, uh, and not most, all developed economies in the world, uh, any of the major countries in Europe, Japan, South Korea, etc. What you will see is that roughly 75 to 85 percent of their GDP, their gross uh, domestic product, uh, is actually services, right? So when we're talking about marketing offerings, it's a big envelope that basically uh, fulfills uh, the placeholder of what will be a product, services, or anything else. Okay, and think about it from this perspective. Products are important for customers only because they provide some benefit. Okay, we'll talk some more about this when we talk uh, about marketing myopia, which is what I, we have next. So, what do I mean by this? Um, think about it like this: uh, if you buy a drill, right? If you buy a drill, a tool, right? Something that enables you to do certain things like for example if you want to put a picture up in the wall right you can just take the drill make a hole in the wall and then put some sort of fastener that enables you to just hang your picture right so the benefit that you're trying to uh, obtain by buying the drill is not the drill itself is what you can do with the drill right so customers don't care about drills what do i mean by this unless you're a drill collector i mean and you could be right there's nothing wrong with that but most people don't care about drills per se what they care about is what they can do with the drill okay so customers look at your products and services as a set or a bundle of benefits that they obtain from them okay and those benefits could be very varied right so in the case of the drill that i was talking about right uh, it's not only the functionality but also could be pride pride of ownership right if it's a really nice drill and you know all about drills and the kind of brands that are in the marketplace maybe just owning that particular drill provides you with the benefit of knowing that you have something that is particularly i don't know efficient high performance whatever it is right and those are absolutely a uh, reasonable benefits right that maybe a, a person like me who maybe doesn't care that much about drills is not actually uh, going to be thinking about but think about it from another perspective what happens if i don't buy a drill and i buy one of those little uh, 3m uh, stickers that enable you to hang things from the wall up to i think it's about 10 15 pounds right that would be plenty for me to hang a picture right unless it's a huge picture Right. So in that situation, uh, because I don't care about drills, uh, the sales for drills are going to go down when 3M launches a product like this, because a lot of people that were buying a drill just to hang pictures and do a couple of things around the house because they are not very handy, they're just not going to buy them. Right. So this is a, a phenomenon that we call marketing myopia, right? which is basically being myopic, meaning not seeing uh, uh, appropriately what's in front of you right and it's to notice that customers don't buy the products because of the products and when i say product service is the same okay they buy because of the benefit that they are obtaining okay so unless they are collectors okay if you collect watches for example right which i sort of do for example right so if you collect watches uh, you derive pleasure in ownership of multiple watches, not because of the functional benefit of the product, but because of you like watches, right? Uh, which might be this to you guys, right? Maybe you collect other things, or maybe you don't collect anything at all, right? So unless you're in a situation like this, people don't care about your product. They care about the benefits that they derive from them, right? So the moment that you understand this, you need to define your business not as a company that does a certain product, but a company that provides a certain benefit. So let me tell you about a conversation that I was having with, and this was years ago, let's say about 10 years ago, with an executive from a large consumer packaged good company that makes cleaning products for the house. Right? And this gentleman who is in charge of innovation, at least some of the portions of, this is a really large multi-billion dollar company. And 
he's an executive vice president that deals with innovation and new product development. And he was telling me that he's not worried about what the competition has, the other companies that are making similar products to clean the furniture, right? This was dust polish that we were talking about, right? Which doesn't sound like a very exciting product, right? Uh, but he was telling me that uh, he's not worried about the, what the other guys are going to launch in terms of product properties and how they're going to beat them. He's not worried about that. He knows exactly what they have. He knows all about these products. So what he's worried about is about all this nanotechnology and how it's going to impact the design of furniture. Because what happens when you can put a coating on the furniture that repels the dust? And because of that, you don't need to use dust polishing at all. Who likes using dust polishing? So assuming uh, that people are buying your product because they like it, it's wrong. People are buying your product because of the benefit it provides to them. And the moment that they can achieve that benefit in other way, they are just going to jump in a hurry if it's more convenient, if it has a better performance, or if it's cheaper or all the above, obviously. So define your business as the benefit that they are, basically the customer is getting from the business and not as the product that is associated with it. Now, like I was mentioning before, um, people come to you because they want to get some value, right? And that value is going to come from that benefit that they are getting. And if the value that they are getting from your product, service, or solution, solution is a combination of products and services, right? Uh, then they will go ahead and exchange usually money or maybe time, money, and... Uh, and maybe information, right? You have a lot of free games now that all they want to know is what it is that you're doing and who you are so they can actually sell that information to somebody else, right? So the exchange can be in terms of money, which is the more traditional sense, or it could be your time or maybe some of your information, right? But you're exchanging something that is valuable to the firm for something that is valuable to you, right? In the cases of a free video game in your computer, or in your uh, cell phone, right? Uh, you're getting the benefit of, you know, entertainment, having a good time, right? And the company, if it's a free game, it's getting the time of you having maybe eyeballs on the screen, right? So they can put an ad at the bottom, right? So they could monetize that that way, or they can sell your information, right? But the company is getting something out of it. There is nothing free, right? So that is the exchange that is happening. And the exchange will only happen when I agree that what I get out of the, out of the product, in this case, the video game, it's more than how much I'm giving away, which in this case, it will be uh, maybe having to deal with annoying ads or uh, having my information sold to another company so they can actually market other things to me. Right. And when that exchange uh, happens because the value is there, hopefully you can maintain that value in the long term. And what you're going to do is you're going to try to create a relationship right, where the customer keeps coming back. So what happens when you launch a new version of the game? Right. Are these customers going to stay? And if the game is not good, they're just going to move on because they don't see the value in the game, right? So what you're striving for is you're striving for building these long-term relationships instead of just selling something right now, right? So we're trying to take a perspective that it's more long-term instead of a short-term, more myopic view of uh, exchanges um, in marketing, right? Now, we've been talking about exchanges. Now, where do these exchanges take place? In the marketplace, right? And what is a marketplace? A marketplace is a collection of customers and potential customers, okay? So it's really, you know, broadly defined, right? It's, you know, the world obviously comes from the world market where you literally had a group of people setting up their goods and maybe services, but mostly goods originally, right? Looking back a few thousand years right, for people to come and, you know, buy them, right? So in the marketplace, you're going to have companies and you're going to have also customers. And the companies are going to provide products and services, like I said before. So on the company side, a market is essentially identifying customers, right, understanding their needs. And after we've understand their needs, designing some product or service that is going to 
help them see the value, right? Create some value for them. And then uh, concluding that transaction with them, right? So, you know, making sure that they understand what it is that they are getting and hopefully uh, emphasizing what the good points of the product are. Uh, on the consumer side, uh, the consumers are going to also engage in actions within the marketplace, right? They're going to look for the products or services, right? And sometimes the search could be very involved, right, when you're buying a house, right? And it's not something that you're going to buy quickly, for the most part, right? Unless you are, I don't know, like uh, Jeff Bezos, right, who I think in the last six months he's bought uh, multiple mansions, right? But I mean, he has a few billion dollars, right? So for him, spending a few million dollars in a house, uh, it's like the way you and I maybe buy, uh, I don't know, a meal at a restaurant, right? It's it's a different ball game. But you know, we search for products, right? We do a lot of, you know, we go online, we look for reviews, and we talk to people that we know, and. Sometimes we interact directly with the company uh, to get some more information. So you go to the website or you call customer service representative and talk to them. Uh, or maybe you visit a dealer if you're buying a car, for example, and talk to a salesperson. right? And then finally, you make a purchase. right? Once that you've decided that the value is there and that you want to go forth with, with the purchase, the transaction. And <clears throat> now... So what are the key elements in the marketplace then, as we have discussed it, right? So what do we have? Uh, well, we have the central element. And this is interesting, I hope for you guys, that we are gonna be looking at marketing from the perspective of the company. You are a professional consumer. You've been a consumer roughly for 20 years, right? So you know all about the marketplace from the perspective of the consumer. Uh, and what we're going to do in this class is we're going to kind of give you a perspective of the firm, right? Where a lot of the things that you already have observed come from and why are there. Uh, and also try to understand all the pieces of the puzzle, right? So we're going to start from the firm. This is going to be our lens. This is where we're going to, the way we're going to be looking at the, at the whole marketplace, right? So the company. Uh, and the company could be making a product or a service. Like I said, it, it really doesn't matter. Uh, services uh, add a, a layer of complication. We will talk about them, I think, in Chapter 8. Um, if I remember correctly, I don't have very good memory. Uh, we'll, we'll get there. Okay. So you're going to have the company that's going to be providing this product or service. But for this company to provide the product or service, it needs to have some suppliers, right? So if you're Tesla, for example... Right, Mr. Elon Musk, making electric cars, right? Uh, what do you need to make an electric car? Well, you need companies that supply you with, for example, the batteries, right? So uh, Tesla used to have an agreement with LG, right? Uh, providing, actually, yeah, uh, was it LG or was it Panasonic? Maybe I'm confused between those two. Anyway, you have a supplier that provides your batteries. Now, Tesla over the years have learned sufficiently about batteries that they are making their own batteries, right? But initially they have a contract that, you know, provides those uh, batteries so they can actually go ahead and make the cars. What else do you need? Then you need other components like the, you know, electric motors. What else do you need? You need steel and aluminum to make the body of the car, right? And you need like microprocessors for the, you know, nice uh, big screens, big screen, there's only one, uh, in each of their cars, right? 15 inches in the Model 3, right? So you have some suppliers that provide you products or services, right, that you need for running the business. Like two weeks ago, for example, uh, Tesla sued Alameda County because they were not letting them reopen their factory, right? I'm sure that... Uh, the company went to a set of lawyers and, you know, asked them to file the, the lawsuit on their behalf, right? So that will be a supplier for them, right? That's providing legal services in this case, not necessarily only goods, right, for the company to operate, okay? Uh, you're going to have other companies that operate in the same marketplace, right? So if you're talking about cars, right, like we were talking about a minute ago, uh, who is competing with uh, Tesla? Well, 
And if you look at it broadly, any car manufacturer is competing with Tesla. Right now in the US, uh, car sales uh, for fully electric cars, uh, I think they are roughly 3% of the market, right? So most car manufacturers are actually not making electric vehicles, or if they are making electric vehicles, they are selling very few of them. Okay. So you could say maybe General Motors is competing with with Tesla, right? So that would be one of the competitors. So maybe you'll see no, only compare, we're gonna define the market as electric vehicles and then uh, General Motors still doesn't have electric vehicles. Actually it does, right? The Bolt. So yeah, General Motors will be a good competitor then. Whether you define it narrowly or you define the market more broadly. And by the way, this definition is really up to you. Right? Um, and then we have marketing intermediaries. These are companies that make sure that the products and services get to the final consumer, right? So let's move away from cars. Let's say that you're making, I don't know, let's say that you're Gillette, right? And you're making uh, razors, right? And uh, so that you can shave, right? Let's say that, you know, for some reason you wanna shave, you don't like to have a beer. And in that situation, how do you get those razor blades from the company to the final consumer, instead of buying them directly from Gillette, you actually go to Walmart or Target or CVS, right? And those are marketing intermediaries. They don't make anything, but they actually uh, enable you to get you know, your products and services conveniently and when you want them, right? So they provide some service to you. In this case, it will be stocking the product and, you know, uh, providing a safe environment, hopefully, although without the riots, you never know, right? Um, a safe environment where you can actually acquire the products that you are actually looking for, right? And then what do we have at the end of this puzzle? It's the final consumer, right? And this is you and me, right? And, and it's gonna, sometimes you're gonna be able to interact directly with the firm, right? So for example, in the case of Tesla, uh, there are no dealerships involved. You buy directly your cars from the company. <clears throat> That's not the case with the case of General Motors, right? If you want to buy a car directly from General Motors, General Motors is going to tell you, go and visit one of our dealers, okay? Um, take Coke, right? Let's say that you like Coke. Uh, you can go to their website, and if you go to their website, you will see that you cannot buy Coke directly from them, okay? Actually, you might be able to buy one of the specialty cans that have your name on it, and they'll sell it to you for a lot of money. But a regular six pack of Coke or or whatever size they sell, I honestly don't know. I don't buy uh, I don't buy Coke, and you're not going to be able to buy it directly from them. You're going to have to go through the store, right? So you're going to have these intermediaries. Okay, we're going to talk more about this when we talk about channels. Okay, good. So this whole set of players is what you need to understand in the marketplace. Okay. If you have any questions about any of this, let me know. Good. So like I was saying before then, marketing management, which is what we're gonna be studying, right? It's how we actually manage this whole marketing story, is going to be creating that value for a set of target markets, right? What is a target market? It's a collection of customers that we have identified as being similar, right? And, and the reason why we're gonna do this, by the way, I will mention it later on again, but it's because, you know, ideally you wanna treat everybody as an individual, right? Because we're all different. But uh, from a business perspective, oftentimes that uniqueness is not so big that it basically does not necessarily require to do everything differently, okay? So instead of treating everybody individually, which will be ideal, but maybe too costly oftentimes, unless you're talking about things like a house, right? Where, you know, there is a lot of uh, margin in there because you're talking about a very expensive product, okay? Oftentimes what you're gonna do is you're gonna put people into groups. We're gonna call those segments, okay? And segments are going to be defined by some characteristic, right? So you could use, for example, uh, gender to keep it very simple. There are other variables and we'll talk about them later, right? So you could say males versus females, right? When it comes down to razor blades, you can go to the store and one thing that you'll notice is that there are products that are differentiated by gender. Uh, if you're an engineer, you will notice that uh, the differences between the two uh, products oftentimes are 
mostly aesthetic, right? It might be the color or maybe slightly different handle, but honestly, um, it's more to make it look different than anything else, right? And what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to group these customers in terms of uh, something that makes them similar. In this case, it will be gender. And then we're gonna try to identify which one of those segments are we interested in. We're gonna call that a target market. Okay, so for example, it could be that I decide, hey, I'm going to try to uh, engage in, in relationship or in transactions with males only or females only, whatever it is, or maybe both, right? Uh, you don't need to pick and choose. You can do multiple ones, right? That's okay. And then what you're trying to do is you're trying to provide value for them so that they will actually create uh, this relationship and hopefully you know, it, it will last a long time, right? The longer it lasts, if it's profitable, the more money I'm going to be making, right? And to do that, what you're going to do is you're going to use this idea of the value proposition, right? So let me talk to you about it a little bit more. So the value proposition, <clears throat> it's basically a promise that you make to a customer about the value that they are going to achieve if they engage in a transaction with you. So this is a forward-looking future promise of value, right? And of course, when you're doing something like this, you're gonna have to provide reasons to believe, right? So why should you believe that, you know, I'm going to provide you with a good hotel experience, right? So maybe you can discuss facts, like, you know, what kind of amenities are in the hotel. So it's gonna be fun because, you know, we have this, that, and the other, right? So the value proposition is basically a condensing for the customer what kind of benefits they are going to acquire if they engage in a transaction with you. Okay. So it's a very, very important piece, especially when you're talking about dealing with new customers, right? Somebody that has never bought your products or services, right? So distilling your value proposition in a way that uh, is very clear concise and that it talks about the benefits as opposed to the product itself it's absolutely essential to make sure that people actually come and buy your product okay. now let's talk a little bit about how marketing has changed over time because it has quite a bit okay and let's start from the beginning and by the beginning i really mean the beginning right so go back a few thousand years right and Maybe you don't want to go a few thousand years. Let's go back to the Middle Ages, which is a long time ago, right? Uh, a long time ago. Let's say about 1,200, 1,100, so almost a thousand years back. Uh, you had marketplaces, right? There were places where you could actually buy stuff. But stuff was really limited, and by stuff I mean everything, right? So if you look at an average person uh, living in the Middle Ages, uh, they had, if they were lucky, they had a pair of shoes, one pair of shoes, maybe one or two pairs of socks, right? Maybe one or two pairs of pants, maybe one or two shirts, probably one. And then they'll have some garment, right? To put on top when they were cold, some sort of jacket or I don't know, something, right? But products were very scarce, right? And oftentimes they were made by the person that was using them because you couldn't find them in the marketplace, right? So in a situation like this, where there is very few to be bought at the stores, there are no stores, right? There might be a location where people congregate, where they might bring some of the products that they have maybe excess of, or they have made if they are an artisan, right? But that's it. In that situation, marketing was about production. What do I mean by this? Well, if you could make it, you could sell it. And the reason why you could sell it is because there was not a lot to be around, right? There was not a lot of competition. Uh, if you went to a marketplace, there was probably one place where they would sell bread because that was the only bread in town, right? Maybe two, maybe, maybe, right? And bread being a common thing, but what about shoes? You'll have to make them, uh, have them custom order and see if they can actually make them for you. Right. So in this situation, it's all about production. If you can make it, if you can improve your production system to achieve higher levels of productivity and because of that, be able to bring more product to the marketplace, you're going to be doing very well. Right. And, and here, typical example will be Henry Ford. Right. 
how uh, he put on uh, he did a lot of things right by the way and we can discuss about this maybe another day but one thing that he's well known for is applying the concepts of a production line to cars right cars uh, were a product that uh, started in the 19th century the late 19th century but they were very expensive they were custom made for the most part and ordering one was a big ordeal and you either had a lot of money or you had no car and his view uh, according to what we know and what he wrote is that if he could make them cheap enough people would buy them and they would become ubiquitous which he was right right and, and the way he achieved that was by basically coming with processes that will enable them him to his firm for uh, make the cars for cheaper and you know he created production lines they existed already in other product categories but not in cars and he improved it quite a bit he was an engineer right and and also what he did is he simplified the product uh, in fact there is a famous phrase from him uh, that says you could have when it comes down to the Model T, which was one of the models that he launched early on, uh, you can have any color so long as it's black, right? So he kept the product really simple. It was the opposite to what was in the marketplace, which was customized. And the reason why he did that is because he wanted to be able to make more of it so that he could sell it for cheaper. Now, what happens as this goes on is that, you know, people get better at producing and because of that there is more product in the marketplace and as competition increases because there is more of the product it's not only you but other firms are starting to make cars or you know dishwashers or bread right it doesn't really matter everything what starts happening is firms realize that unless they make the products better they are not selling their products because there is enough supply in the marketplace so here in the product concept, you move from production to product quality improvement, right? So now what you're trying to do is you're trying to make the products better, you know, build a better mousetrap, right? And so this is quality improvement, ISO certification, making sure that your products are not defective, right? That they actually feel nice. And, and there's a whole science that comes behind this, right? Things like ergonomics, uh, for example, talking about cars, right? We were talking about cars, uh, quality improvement. So there are people inside firms that all they do is they make sure that when you close the door, it sounds right. It doesn't sound teeny, it sounds like thunk. It sounds like high quality because your perception of a car is not only dictated by, you know, knowing that the car is well put together, but actually that it feels put together well put together right so quality improvement over here okay and like i said quality is not only objective quality but also perceived quality that's what matters right is what people perceive what they notice now quality will only take you so far what do i mean by this well uh, there are diminishing marginal returns right so if i create here a quick diagram it's not going to be pretty sorry i'm really bad at drawing okay and so here on this axis I have quality, right? And here in this axis, I have satisfaction. Satisfaction is how happy you are with the product. Okay, sorry. It's gonna be a little ugly, okay? Uh, let me change color so that you see. These are just the axis, right? And you can measure this how you measure quality, like number of faults per thousand or something like that. And satisfaction, it could be a one to seven score. Is a Liker scale that says, you know, overall, I'm really happy with this product. It could be a car, it could be chocolate, it could be bread, it could be a cell phone, I don't care. It doesn't matter, right? What's going to happen with satisfaction and quality is that the more quality you have, the more satisfied you are, but this is going to go at a diminishing rate. And it doesn't really go down. I didn't draw it right. This is going to keep increasing, but it increases at diminishing rate. Okay, so in the beginning, uh, a little change in quality is going to go a long way in terms of how much satisfaction you get. But the same increase over here of one unit of quality, whatever that measure is, it barely gets you any improvements in satisfaction, right? Uh, so when you have already a nice car, having an even nicer car doesn't make a big difference, right? 
because you already have all the features that you want and it's already nice as it is, right? Good. So when quality got to a point where further improvements didn't make much of a difference, then people started focusing on selling. Selling is just basically uh, trying to convince people to buy the product because it has certain features or benefits, right? And what you're doing is you're putting your emphasis on the communications of those value uh, propositions that you have created. Okay, so this is about doing advertising, etc. Because now it's not good enough that you're making it or that it's good quality, but also you need to sell it because there is so much in the marketplace. And this only gets you so far. Again, the same thing, right? Eventually, everybody's doing the selling, and then there's just a cacophony of people telling you, buy, 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 which is what you find in a lot of places, right? There is a lot of clutter, a lot of marketing clutter, especially advertising, right? It's everywhere, right? And here, I will argue, is where the break happens in terms of the marketing philosophy. This over here assumes that the firm knows what it is that they know how to do and they're just going to sell that to you so i know how to make cars i'm going to make a better car that was here and then i'm going to sell it to you that's here so it assumes that the firm knows so i'm a fantastic engineer i can do something cool sell it to you over here from here on the story changes right now what we're going to do is we're going to flip the story we're going to start with the customer instead of starting with what i know how to make right whether it's cars or provide a service like you know maybe an, i'm an accountant and i can do taxes for you right like i was mentioning before now instead of starting with what i know how to do what i'm going to do is start with the customer try to understand their needs wants and demands we've already talked about them right and after we really truly understand our customer now we can design something to help them what are their pain points what are the things that are not working appropriately so once that i can actually identify those what can i do i can create some new value right something better okay good now And that's the marketing concept, right? The idea that you start with the customer, you design a product or a service that is unique, and then uh, you engage in a relationship with the customer because you started from what they wanted and you created something that is valuable to them, like I was mentioning. This is very different than before, okay? And then finally, there is this societal marketing concept, which is, but it's kind of hot now, I philosophically have some problems with it, and we can talk about why, but the idea is going beyond the customer to society overall, okay, and do what's best for society. Now, the problem with this, if you've seen the news at all, is that it's very hard for people to agree on what's the best thing to do for society. Case in point, COVID-19, right? So if you ask some people, like maybe elderly and people that are involved in healthcare, they'll tell you everybody needs to be in lockdown, no one needs to get out. Right? But if you ask other groups of society, they will tell you that they want to reopen the economy because we are losing jobs, the economy is tanking, and the consequences of this are going to be really bad, worse than maybe the disease itself. Right? And there is this back and forth. Right? And this happens with so many things. Right? You know, if you look about being green and recycling, some people like it, some people dislike it. Right? So what I'm trying to say is the moment that you start talking about doing what's best for society, who decides what's best for society? And by the way, there are several examples where you can see companies that have moved to this societal marketing concept and it has backfired on them. Uh, if you're interested in this, you can look, for example, Google Gillette. Uh, they had an ad campaign about toxic masculinity and it cost them $3 billion. They lost $3 billion six months after that because people stopped buying their products and because they were upset, right? So because they are portraying men in a way that, you know, they don't agree. And you may agree or disagree. I don't care. It doesn't matter. The important thing is for you to understand what the consequences are to looking at society as something homogeneous. It is not. People have different interests. Now, here, you're not doing that. You are looking at the individual, right? And you're trying to start with what satisfied that individual. And we can make trade-offs, right? 
uh, but society i think it's tricky right so i'm not a big fan of this that doesn't mean you need to not be a big fan you just need to understand what it is and run with it right if you think this is a great thing just do it right some people are all excited about it right it's kind of the hard thing but it does have cost and i want you to understand that so how are you going to provide that value for the customer and the answer is your marketing mix right so what you're going to do is you're going to come up with a product that hopefully fulfills the need of those customers that you're trying to target you're going to price it appropriately you're going to promote it right things like advertising sales promotion discounts right and the last p which is kind of funny right it's place or also means channels of distribution right place it's because you wanted to make it four p's right to make it easier to remember what it is but nobody really calls it place except for when you're talking about the four piece but it's basically getting that product to your customer right how are you going to get that product or service to your customer and that's basically channels of distribution how are you going to distribute that product okay and an integrated marketing program is basically taking into consideration all these variables in a way that they work cohesively right so if your product's supposed to be premium your price should be premium because otherwise people get a mixed message and they don't know what to do with that, right? So everything needs to work in conjunction. You have a phenomenal car and you're selling to me at a premium, but the dealership, it's not very nice, right? Uh, it's just sending the wrong message to the customer and that's just not gonna come, right? So the value needs to be an overall picture of all these elements that are important in the exchange, okay? Now, like i was mentioning before not only we want to engage in exchanges with customers but we want to do so in a repeated manner right so we want to make sure that you keep coming back so you're happy uh, and because of that satisfaction is going to be one of the key variables that we're going to be looking at when we're trying to determine how well we're doing in the marketplace so it's not just about profits today it's about profits in the long term and to achieve those profits in the long term and uh, which are only going to happen when you're providing that value for the customer and you need to look at satisfaction right let me talk a little bit more about that so what is satisfaction uh, it's essentially the extent to which that product has fulfilled the benefits that it has promised and has gone beyond what you expected right so a key aspect of satisfaction is what expectations do you have prior to engaging in a transaction with the firm okay because of this it is absolutely essential that you manage expectations right and it's a tricky business because if you lower the expectations too low you can over overcome it so people are going to be more satisfied so if you tell me for example that the pizza is going to arrive in four hours but you send it to me in two that's great in the sense that i expected four and you send it in two so i'm going to be happy however if you tell me that it's going to take you four hours maybe i'm just instead of buying from you i'm going to buy from somebody else who tells me that it's going to have it here in 30 minutes right so the expectations cannot be lower so much that people just don't get excited about it expectations play a dual role right if your expectations are high you think that the restaurant is going to be good you are more likely to go now of course if they are impossibly high you're always going to be disappointed right so you need to manage those expectations and satisfaction is going to be a result of how those expectations are actually managed so you need to explain to people what it is that they are going to be receiving in terms of product or service okay and that needs to be high enough expectations that they will come but not so high that you will never uh, delight them by uh, fulfilling those expectations and going beyond that now to put emphasis on not only satisfaction but it is another metric that is very important which is customer lifetime value so the idea is if you look at customers as a potential partner that you're going to try to establish a relationship with long term and you stop thinking about the sales today you start thinking about the sales tomorrow right so you need to have some sort of metric that enables you to basically value how much that relationship is worth to you right and customer lifetime value is essentially that 
metric, right? That basically looks at the exchanges that you're going to have with the customer over the long term and how much are they valued today. Now, this metric comes from finance, right? So this is essentially finance applied to marketing, but it's important for you to understand. So I'm going to walk you through an example. It's not in the book. So pay attention. If you have any questions, let me know. Okay. So here is the formula for customer lifetime value. Now, don't get scared out of the formula, right? I'm going to break it down to you. Hopefully it's going to be simple. Okay, I'm going to give you some simple numbers. The cool thing about customer lifetime value is you can use it in any business. Okay, it's not easy to estimate some of these things, right? You're going to have to guess a little bit. But if you're an experienced person in that industry, you can actually come up with numbers for it. So let me walk you through it. First, it starts with the sigma, right? Sigma is just a sum. Okay, so if you know how to add, you're fine. We're just going to add multiple terms here. And I'm going to break it down, down for you later. And you're adding from A1 to N, where N is... A large number right this we're gonna call the horizon so let's say that you think that you know you can make plans five years out in your business so n will be five what do you think that you know uh, customers are gonna stick to you you know if things are good for maybe five years right planning out more than five years may be difficult right if you're in a technology space you don't know what's gonna be after five years right in other industries like insurance maybe n should be 10 or 20 because you know relationships tend to be long term right so you you decide how long you want to be be out and the example we're gonna use we're gonna go five years out but you can make it longer that's really your choice right then we're gonna have here margin what is margin um Margin is the difference between your price and your variable cost, right? So you're charging X for your for your product or service, right? And it costs you Y to make. Well, the difference between X and Y, that's your margin. That's how much you are pocketing uh, clean of your variable cost. Then you have the cost of marketing, right? This could be things like advertising uh, or salespeople that you have to pay to actually have... Uh, that product sold right so you're going to take your margin and you're going to subtract your other cost which is going to be your marketing cost okay so what you're going to have here is essentially your profit right per unit so for each unit that you sell to this customer of whatever you're making right it could be a car like i said it could be a house it could be bread it could be coke it could be whatever you like right and, and it could be life insurance right if you want to make it boring and nothing wrong with life insurance it's just not very exciting and so we're going to take this this is going to be our profit per unit right or for time period in this case and now what we're going to do is we're going to acknowledge the fact that some of our customers they are going to go away what do i mean by going away it means that tomorrow let's say that you're doing this on a yearly basis they will just go to either the competitors they will stop buying the product category altogether right and we're going to call this the retention rate this is the people that stay with us right so if this is 90 percent, that would mean that 90 percent of our customers stay with us every year hence 10 percent go away and they're going to keep going away right and we're going to acknowledge that by you know elevating this to the power of the period that we're in so on the first year and sorry in the first year we're going to lose 10 percent of the customers but on the second year we're going to lose more than 10 percent because it compounds right so yeah so you're going to go from having 90 percent of your initial customers to having 81 percent of your initial customers and so on and so forth and then finally, what we're going to do is we're going to acknowledge the fact that the money tomorrow is not worth the same as the money today. And the way we do this is using a discount factor. Right? So we're going to discount our money because the money five years down the line, uh, it's not worth the same as today. Two reasons why. One is inflation, right? We know that things are going to be more expensive uh, a few years down the line. But two, there is risk associated with that money. You still don't have it, right? So you should acknowledge that with the so let me see how you apply this formula let me give you an example right so let's just come up with simple numbers right so we have a price of hundred dollars this is let's say this is for a inexpensive cell phone right I'm charging a hundred dollars let's say that the variable cost of making that cell phone is fifty dollars that's how much it costs the company to make the thing right and you can get this from your accounting department your price is your price whatever you're charging uh, customers if they can buy it directly from you right so your margin is going to be a hundred minus fifty so it's fifty dollar margin let's say that your cost of advertising is twenty dollars right 
And by the way, when I say advertising, it could be any other function that marketing is fulfilling. It doesn't have to be that. It could be customer service. It could be multiple things, right? Say $20, right? And then you have a retention rate of 90%. That means 10% of your customers go away every year, okay? And let's assume that the discount rate is 10%. This will include inflation plus uh, any other interest that you should be achieving because of the risk involved, right? So if you're getting a loan, right, 4% uh, right now for a fixed asset like a mortgage, uh, inflation is about 2%, so that will be 6% plus. Uh, businesses are more risky than a mortgage, so because of that, we are adding some extra, so let's say that is 10%. And good. And then finally, we have an acquisition cost. This is the amount of money that it costs me as a firm to acquire those customers, to bring them in. Right? For example, in the case of a cell phone, uh, this could be... Uh, well, if I'm Verizon, right, uh, it could be given a discount on the phone, right? Uh, so this could be, you know, give me the cell phone just for $50 instead of $100. So put in MSRP $100, but your cost today is $50. So this could be an acquisition cost. Okay, good. So now what happens on the first year? In the first year, A is equal to 1. Right, and now all we're gonna do is we're gonna apply this formula right here. Okay, so I'm gonna take the margin, right, which is gonna be 50 minus my cost of marketing, which is gonna be 20. So it's gonna get I'm gonna have 30 dollars in there, and then I'm gonna take my retention rate, which I have right here, and I'm gonna elevate it to the power of one minus one. One minus one is zero, right? And I'm assuming you know this, but any number that uh, you elevate to the power of zero gives you one okay you will see that in a minute right here right? so we have 30 here is the profit we're making per customer after we discount our marketing cost and our variable cost and then here in the uh, denominator what we have is we have year one so a is equal to one right here and because of that you are dividing by 1.1. So 1 plus 0 0.1 to the power of 1. By the way, that 0 0.1 is this discount factor right here. Okay. So what do we have in the end? We have 30 times 1 divided by 1.1, which if you have a calculator handy, you will see is $27.3. This is all in dollars. Okay. Good. Now, on year 2, we do the same calculations, but notice the only thing that changes is that now A, instead of being 1, is 2. So this number here changes. So now we're not doing to the power of 0, we're doing to the power of 1. So you're going to have 0.9, right? And the same thing you're going to have here to the power of 2, okay? And when you do these calculations and you repeat the same thing, you're going to get 22.3. So what's going to happen is after the years goes by, any payouts that I get are going to be worth less than before. Before it was 27.3, now it's going to be 22.3. Why? Because, like I said, money tomorrow is worth less than money today. Okay, and you repeat the same thing for year three. And as you can see, the only thing that changes here is three and three, right? And you do these calculations in your calculator and you'll get 18.3. And you can repeat this to infinity. Let's just assume that in our case, our time horizon is five. So let's say that we're going to do this for five years because, I don't know, we're in a technology space, cell phones, right? And we don't know what's going to be down the line in five years. So we think five years as far as we can plan out. Okay. And in that situation, if you repeat the calculations and you add all the terms, remember that big ugly sigma that we have in the formula is just summation, right? So all we're doing is we're adding these terms that they get smaller and smaller over time, okay? They get smaller because of two things, honestly. One is because you're discounting it, but also because you're losing customers, right? Remember, we had that retention rate in there that it's gonna make it smaller and smaller over time. And then at the end, what we are subtracting here is your acquisition cost. Oh, I make a mistake here. This was supposed to be 50. So I made a mistake. You should say 50 here. My apologies, okay? You can see it is correct here, it's 50, okay? And then what you end up having is you end up having a profit of 45. 
So even though in the first year you don't make any money because it costs you $50 to acquire that customer and it only pays out 27.3, in the long term, in five years, you are making money with the customer. So this is the value of customer lifetime value, where you can value uh, how much a customer is worth to you financially and you can make decisions based on this. There are other metrics that you can use also, like share of the customer. That means what percentage of their budget is spent on your company, right? So, for example, if I'm Target, right, I want to know how much of uh, my budget for groceries and, you know, uh, any other products that I can buy from Target, I'm buying at Target. If I'm buying 30% of it, that means that my share of customer, because I'm spending money in Walmart also and maybe in Aldi, let's say, right? My share of customer will only be 30%. So this is the view that, you know, the customer is voting with their wallet and you want to know how much they are living in your firm. They might be spending a lot of money, but if they are spending more money in other places, uh, share of customer is a good metric to basically try to improve the relationship with the customer. This is a good indication of how much they value your firm, right? Because if they value it a lot, they will spend a large percentage of their expenditure in that product category. Customer equity is basically uh, the reverse of the customer lifetime value. It's what happens when you add all those customer lifetime values of all your customers. So this is a good metric of how much your brand is worth. Okay, customer equity is kind of the flip side of brand equity because your brand is valuable because your customers are there, right? Because your customers are gonna keep buying your product. Okay. Now, let me say this. I, we're going to talk about digital a little bit throughout the class, but digital is the big change in the last 10 years in marketing, right? It's the fact that people now spend time on their phone, on their tablet, social media, and where they spend time, that's what marketing is. And so a lot of the big changes that have happened in marketing, other than what I've already talked historically, is the fact that now digital and social media play an absolutely prevalent role and we're going to talk through it uh, as we discuss products as we discuss prices etc etc okay uh, what other things have changed other than digital media uh, non-for-profits are big right and they behave a little bit different because they don't care so much about profit although they still need funds to run and because of that they're still going to want to maximize the impact that they have in terms of exchanges in this case it will be through maybe uh, donations etc okay uh, you have the globalization now this has been like this for the last i will say at least 40 years that globalization has gotten bigger and bigger and more and more important that's when you exchange goods and services with other countries I suspect, and this is just happening as we speak, and uh, this is going to slow down or even start going backwards because of COVID-19. So it's going to be interesting to see when the book was printed last year, right? Globalization, globalization, globalization. Right now, uh, we'll see. I think this could actually be changing. So that's going to be interesting. Uh, scary, but interesting. Okay. And then this idea of sustainable marketing, right? So taking into consideration the environment. And what can you actually do in the long term? Not only what you can do today. Okay. And this is all that we have discussed today, which is a lot. Okay. This is the whole marketing system, right? It uh, starts with understanding the customer. You always start with the customer first, right? And then based on that, what you're going to do is you're going to design a value proposition. And hopefully based on that value proposition, good product or service, right? And then uh, you're going to create your 4P program, right? Your price, your product, uh, your place, right? And then you're going to build a relationship with your customer. And based on that value that they actually see, they will hopefully stay, right? If their expectations are fulfilled. And then you're going to be able to track that using customer lifetime value like we have already mentioned. Okay. I think that was a handful for today.